getting used to. Uh, so FICA break was definitely one of them, which is like they, they take like these two or three FICA breaks during the working hours, which is like these 15, 20 minute coffee breaks. But they're like they take them like almost like as if they're mandatory. So well, I would call my <laughs> they should be. And I would call my accountant and I'd be like, hey, I have a question about this invoice. And he's like, oh, on my FICA break, call me in 20 minutes. And I'm like, but you answered the phone. And he just asked me, and I was like, nope. On my feet, can break. Call me back in twenty minutes. <laughs> I got, I got some, uh, I got some coffee. I, we talked about this. I got some, some coffee from Sweden from some little shop in Kalmar, right? Yeah. And it's delicious. And then you told me to call them, and then they don't speak. They have no idea what I'm talking about. No. <laughs> and I'm like, but I want to find this. It's, I don't know what it is, but it's delicious. It's got some off aroma to it that's not coffee that's added to it. They, they have really mastered coffee here. They really know what they're doing here and when you go to coffee shops first of all it's weird because they don't have chains here so you don't find starbucks on every corner like mm. you do in la uh you don't find like dunkin donuts like it's it's a lot of just things that are complete opposites like even driving down the hallway you don't see giant billboards and advertisements like it's just like free space like just nothing even buildings don't have giant advertisements on them um, and that's the beauty of it is, is that because you don't have these chains taking over and taking the small mom and pop shop out of business, you do have all these quaint, cute boutique coffee shops. And each one of them does their own little twist and their own little specialty that they've been doing since the 1920s and it's been passed on. And, you know, they all got it like their own little thing. And, you know, every time Hilak comes down here, uh, she has specific coffee shops that she goes to that she knows that she's like, this is a spot. I love this spot. You know, sounds like and, a Hallmark movie. Yeah. And they all <laughs> feel like they're, they're all built into like little houses. Like a lot of the coffee shops, especially in Kalmar are built into, uh, what used to be like an old house mm. and then somebody bought it or, and changed it into a cafe. So you'd walk in on the first floor, take your coffee and then go upstairs to where the bedroom used to be. But now it's just a bunch of rooms filled with tables and chairs and you're like staying in a house. But that like, sounds amazing. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's, you know, I always tell people like there's a reason why these countries all Scandinavia, Denmark, Finland, all these places end up on the happiest place on earth because it's just like they live this like very quaint life of like, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. That sounds awesome. Well, yeah. I noticed we were recording. Yeah, I, I figured, you know, let, let, let's just, let's just roll let's with go. it. <laughs> yeah, let no, it roll, let's, baby. Let's, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Jason, we've got a, a, a special guest with us. Very special and, guest, and I am super excited. Where, uh, where about this. <laughs> they're coming in any minute? <laughs> yeah. If you if you didn't know, uh, wait, I'll, I'll I'll follow up. Go ahead with your intro. Yeah. Um, so joining us today is Shai Dahan, um, and he is a professional artist living in Sweden. And is also the illustrator of the book A is for Analytics, um, which is is a great book. Um, love if we the, can say the, so ourselves, it's amazing. Oh yeah, but like where I was going with that is, is I, I love the illustrations. Right book, book no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I love the illustrations with the llamas. You know, my, my son doesn't necessarily find the concepts fun, but definitely likes you know the the pictures of the the llama holding ice cream um so which so, yeah, by the so, way i should say every kid looks at the llamas differently my if, jason if you recall my daughter well, refers to them as giraffe poodles which i've used <laughs> that terminology in since yeah we, we've forward. hashtagged it <laughs> i i honestly think that they should permanently change the names to giraffe poodles like Agreed. that should be in encyclopedias mm -hmm. llamas also known Agreed. throughout the world as giraffe poodles uh, I mean, she, she's but, not wrong um so i mean if you were gonna name it correctly that's how you would name it yeah it's it's how kids see it it looks like a giraffe with a bunch of hair on it <laughs> so um so jason what were you about to say before uh, i was gonna I say if you to... couldn't if you if you didn't know already from the intro shy shy used to be a stand-up comedian in la yes I actually am a You didn't tell me that many. when we talked before. So there's a lot I didn't tell you. About. <laughs> because my wife was looking at me like, we got three kids. We got to put to bed. You better. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I actually doubled in a lot of things before I found my 
what I'm actually good at, which is art. Everything else is just throwaway talent. Uh, yeah, I, I dabble. It's funny because everything, I, what I realized, I reflected on this recently, which is whatever it is I try, even if I try it as kind of like, I just want to try this, I end up getting myself into a point where I'm like, wow, I'm actually doing pretty all right. And I remember this, the same thing with, with stand up is that I was like, I'm just going to like dabble with stand up. And I went in, I did a few shows and he like in a test, I ended up, uh, performing at both the improv and uh, the comedy store in LA, which if anybody's ever been to LA or to any of these, they know that that's the place where you go see places. Like that's where Seinfeld got a start, where Rock got a start, like even Dave Chappelle has performed there. Those are like the notable places. I've heard um, of it out here on the yeah. East Coast. And, and, and the improv and the, the comedy store are, are such a signature spot to perform as a comedian. And I actually remember one evening, and I think it was the time he was with me there in the audience, um, <clears throat> I ended up uh, being on, on the roster with Chris Rock's brother coming up as the headliner at the end. And it was one of those moments where I kind of realized like, I wasn't even being serious about, I was just doing, <laughs> I was working as a graphic designer at Wells Fargo and was doing this on a Thursday evening for fun. And somehow it ended up becoming what it was. I don't know how. I'm not that funny, according to my kids. Uh, but I'm not really <laughs> sure <laughs> uh, how I ended up there, but uh, yeah, it was a it was a good run. And I'll let you. It, I it's funny because uh, <clears throat> I always do this sometimes with clients. Is this famous uh, two truths and a lie thing? Um, and I always say, here's here's the three things, and you have to decide which one's the lie. And I say, at one point in my career, I met the queen of sweden um i used to be a background dancer for nsync and i used to do comedy stand-up and usually people who know my personality say well clearly you're a comedy stand-up the queen thing maybe the lie must be i don't know jim what do you think is the lie here if you have to say this I, I was gonna say the second one the second one yeah ironically all those things are true I actually was <laughs> dancing for NSYNC at one point. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's it's something I don't talk about too much these days because I have a credibility as a street artist and dancing for Justin Timberlake might not be necessarily the, the best route to go to keep that street cred, but uh, yeah. Can, can okay, you, so, uh, oh, go ahead, Jim. I was, I was gonna say, you mentioned three things there, you know, being an artist, well, actually four things meeting the queen of Sweden, being an artist, working at Wells Fargo and trying out stand up. Like, I mean, it's <laughs> yes. quite the journey. Like, it's quite a journey. Yeah. How did you get to ultimately here? Like, what oh, did you Jesus. learn along the way with each of those things? <clears throat> so, uh, all those things I think happen on accident. I should start by saying that, uh, it's all accident and it's all just, you know, stars aligning, whatever you want to call it, destiny or or luck or whatever you believe in. <laughs> um, I believe in hard work pays off. Uh, but but, it, you know, whatever you put out there comes back to you kind of thing. Um, but my the long story version and feel free to cut me off at any point. But the long story version is that my parents basically moved us to the US in 1989 or so. Uh, because they didn't want me and my sister to serve in the Israeli army because my parents served in the Israeli army and we thought it wasn't all that great. Like, you know, they've lost friends in, during wartime and they've seen their friends die and they just didn't want their kids to experience that. So they moved us to the U.S. to give us a better opportunity. <clears throat> and with that uh, came these opportunities, right? So uh, I was trying acting once I moved out of my parents' house and tried to do the whole stand-up and acting thing. Uh, I think I did a UPS commercial that God knows if it exists anywhere. Um, and then I ended up doing a lot of background stuff for music videos for a while. I was in, for whatever reason, I kept getting hired as the token white guy in almost every rap video in the early 2000s. So Jay-Z, Redman, whatever rapper you can think of, even Eminem, like I was always the token white guy in the background. Um, 
and I did a bunch of music videos. And then because I had my break dancing background from high school, I ended up doing some dance moves on an NSYNC video, which led to another NSYNC video, which kind of led to spun into that. Um, and at the same time I was doing stand up, and then eventually I kind of realized like, you know what, I can't be doing this forever hopping from one thing to the next. Um, and an opportunity came up to work in the mailroom uh, at Wells, which wasn't Wells Fargo at the time. It was a company called Foothill, which did asset-based lending, which is as boring as that sounds. Uh, and I apologize to anybody who was doing asset-based lending, but oh my God. <laughs> if anybody from asset-based lending is listening, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, for a mailroom guy, and it was funny because I, I looked like this, right? Tattoos and everything, working in the mailroom. And the guys always used to come in there and they all went to USC or UCLA and they all wore ties and used to come in and be like, Shawty, listen, uh, do you know I got an important party with my friends this weekend in Vegas? <laughs> you know I can, do you know I can get some marijuana? <laughs> and I was like, I am sorry, but just because I have tattoos and, and a five o'clock shadow, you automatically assume that this meet me in the parking lot after five o'clock and i'll take care of you <laughs> uh, and, uh, that's how it went for a while in the mailroom and um eventually uh i moved into being an assistant for one of the groups one of the asset-based lending groups and i was assistant there and i had an incredible um couple of bosses uh and they were uh they kind of took me under their wings they didn't have to but the one of them actually looked at me and he said you know i see you you you're failing upwards and you're going to continue to fail upwards and i always thought took that as an insult uh until i realized later on in my career that he was actually seeing something in me that everybody else wasn't because everybody else was like you have to have this diploma on the wall and a degree and all this thing to be able to have these positions that we all like to have your own corner office and i was the guy who came with zero university background i barely almost graduated high school and i somehow managed to start climbing myself up i went from the mailroom to being an assistant from an assistant to a junior designer from a junior graphic designer to a senior graphic designer and then by the end of it i was pretty much the creative director for this foothill group that eventually got bought out by wells fargo <clears throat> and I did all of that, elevated my entire career from the mailroom up with a, no degree, no schooling, no nothing, all just self-taught, which is the same thing that happened to me with street art and the art career, which we'll get to in a second. I'm taking the long journey. <laughs> uh, we're taking the PCH down all the way down to, <laughs> to today. Um, <clears throat> so it's uh, it, it was an incredible journey. And I learned a lot during my time at Wells Fargo on the marketing group because it was very much in the circle, right? You're an artist, somebody who wants to work and be creative and be all over the place, but they kind of put you here uh, and they tell you, you know, Wells Fargo has all these strict rules about the logo it should always be up in the top right corner with this and, you know, five centimeters from the corner or whatever it may be. And uh, it really constrains your creativity. Um, but I managed and, and was able to achieve some great things and, Unfortunately for me, in 2008, the economy tanked, as we all remembered, and um, I got laid off, and we were living in New York. So it was one of those, like, do we go back to L.A. and move in with my parents, or do we go try Sweden? Um, and again, one of those things where stars aligned, because I got laid off right at the same time that my wife was graduating from the university in New York, studying fashion. <clears throat> and we said, let's just go and try Sweden. So we hopped over to Sweden and uh, I literally tried to get a graphic design job with almost every advertising agency here and knocking door to door and being like, hey, used to work at Wells Fargo. Can you hire me? And everybody was like, do you speak Swedish? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I was like, no, I just moved here like two weeks ago. And like, well, I'm sorry. All of our ads. This is how they talk, by the way. Uh, they actually do sound like Swedish chef, um, no, but it was very much kind of like, if you can't write or read in Swedish, we, we can't hire you. You ha All the ads are in Swedish. Um, and my wife being the amazing human being that she is kind of said, look, I see talent in you. I know you're an artist by heart. Go try your art career 
for like six months. And if in six months it doesn't take off, you don't get anywhere with it, at least you have learned the language by then. She had no understanding of how <laughs> ADD I am. Um, and she said, give it six months. And that was 13 years ago and never turned back. Seems like yesterday. Seemed like yesterday. Yeah. Um, and the interesting part is that I still use a lot of the things I've learned uh, from Wells Fargo. I still, in the marketing department, I still use today in my career. I think a big part of my success is being able to work with brands and companies by understanding brands. Um, but also there's this like rebel revolt uh, in me uh, that goes against everything that Wells Fargo stood for, which is like, you know, stay in your lane, do what you're supposed to do, all these rules and margins and all this shit. And I'm kind of like, go everywhere and do everything all at once. Um, so yeah, that's the long version. It could be longer, but <laughs> we only have an hour. <laughs> so um, I have so many questions, but so personally, I talk to a lot of people um, that are really good at, at, at a certain craft and they have a desire to go into business and they're coming and talking to me and saying, I love, you know, fill in the blank, whatever I do. Um, but I don't want to think about branding. I don't want to think about having to do sales. I don't want to think about marketing. Um, as a full-time artist, how are you able to, maybe you don't, but how, how do you think about both the business side of, of the shy brand and then the more creative artistic side of, of what you do? Um, they're both right. I, <clears throat> I think of myself as an agency, like a one person agency. Cause it's funny because I do talk to agencies, uh, from time to time and they literally do everything I do, but they have a time, a team of 13 people doing it. Right. So they have a person who does the R and D and they have the person who does the, the proposals and they have the person who does the photo shoots and whatever. I'm like, this is everything I do. I do my own R&D. I do my own proposals in InDesign. Like I, and I think that's because I've learned graphic design. I also learned from the marketing team how to be social and, and from comedy. I learned how to not be fearful. And, you know, I think those things are just uh, a, a natural given for me to be able to, to add value into my brand. Um, but again, I always stand by saying that I have no clue what I'm doing. I just know I'm doing it well because clearly it's working out because it's been working for 13 years and it's it's been an interesting journey and I never know what the next year holds, but every year it's just getting bigger and larger and the, the companies, I mean, you know, I getting to a point where like you, meet the queen of Sweden is not something that happens to everyone every day. I mean, I can tell you that majority of the artists and not just artists, but people that I met throughout my career in Sweden, they probably haven't had the opportunity to stand across the queen of Sweden. And, and somehow I managed to do the right things and put the right parts in to get me to where that is. Um, I think I came to Sweden with a very, not just a US attitude, but a very New York attitude, which is one, I don't take no for an answer. If I really wanna do something, I don't, if I, if I propose something to you, Jason, you're the company I really wanna work with, and you come back and say, thanks, it's not for us. I would imagine the majority of people go, well, that was that, and walk away. I'm more of like, well, he said no, let me try Jim, you know? And then Jim says no, and I say, well, I'm going to try a lot. You know what I mean? Like, and I just keep going until somebody says yes, or until they say, you know what, I, this guy needs to stop nagging us. Let's just do something with him. You know what I mean? Um, I don't talk no for an answer. And, and I think that that's very against the Swedish culture, which is very kind of like, the one thing Sweden is really amazing at is that everybody respects each other's personal space. And not just in a physical form, but also in like, the metaphorical form of like, you know, you don't, like there's certain things, like <laughs> it's funny because there are certain rules or, that that exist in different countries that nobody really talks about. And sometimes you don't find out until you get there. And one of those things for Sweden, for example, is that people don't brag or talk about money. So the person sitting across from you can be very, very wealthy. And you wouldn't know because they do not drive a Maserati or a Tesla or a Porsche or whatever. 
uh, everybody here drives a Volvo or a VW and everybody has uh, very modest houses. People don't build gigantic houses with gigantic TVs. And I mean, look, I'm sure there is a small percentage that do, but but culturally it's not a flaunt your, your worth kind of thing. You don't show your worth. Um, and it's very much kind of, there's this thing where you shouldn't talk about money because to them, it means that you're bragging. You're bragging about having something that other people don't. And it's interesting because once I learned that, I was like, is that what all of us Americans sound to the rest of Europe? Like, we all just like, oh, look at Probably. my new card, you know? Um, I and, put it on I, my credit card. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but it's because of that culture that I think that's where I kind of fit in because I'm taking shots that other people haven't um, and take opportunities that perhaps other people might shy away from because at the end of the day i kind of look at everything like look this is my life this is my career no one's going to hustle me harder than me i used to have a manager for a couple of years when i first moved here and i i let him go because he wasn't hustling me as hard as i know i can hustle myself um and i've my my career exploded after i let him go because i was putting in 200 percent, which you know, any math nerd we know is not possible, but <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> uh, yeah. can you can you talk a little bit about your your upbringing? You mentioned kind of the the move from from Israel to to the states, um, but it, it seems like all of the Dahan siblings have a, a similar cut to them in that. Each of you, while you're all entrepreneurial, I, I think you've all kind of gone the route of doing the corporate thing and it felt incredibly constrained to the point where you're like, I, I just can't do this anymore. I got to do my own thing. So all, all three of you kind of took that similar path. Is it is it something in the DNA or is there something that your your parents kind of fostered as, as It's children? a Jew thing. We yeah. don't let you guys know about it. Uh, it's a secret society knowledge within the Jews. Uh you know, and we get our card and it, we open it up on our bar mitzvah and it says, you're going to be a producer or you're going to be, you know, a director, you're going to be a lawyer. And that's, you know, but doesn't that, but doesn't, or that, a get comedian, right? doesn't that get canceled <laughs> if you eat a lot of pork? Because I've seen, I've seen the barbecues over at Guy's house and I'm not sure he's I bacon them all culture. the time. I mean, let's be honest. If God didn't want to sit in here, oh, Jesus, why well, make it so damn good? Um, <laughs> Look, I was questioning the, the the religious side of things since I was a little kid. It never made any sense to me. But um, it, it's it's one of those things that my dad moved us because he knew that a lot of the... I mean, look, at the end of the day, my grandfather came from Morocco. We come from an Arab background. And then we're brought into Israel and being taught to fight Arabs. And um, this is the main reason why I left to go paint in Palestine, which we'll get to eventually if you want to. Um, but coming from a place where my dad was like, look, they're asking my kid to hold a gun and fight people that are fam like potentially family, that, that just doesn't make sense. Um, so they made a huge sacrifice. I mean, my dad left his sisters and his mom uh, behind to move us to the US in the same way that ironically, I did. I had to leave my sister, my brother, and my parents behind to move to Sweden to hopefully give a better opportunity to my kids and my. And it's not saying that my kids wouldn't have an amazing opportunity in the U.S. It's just, you know, uh, sometimes you take leaps and bounds in in life, and they end up working out. And we're very, very happy where we are, and you know, we have an amazing life. Um, but that's just the sacrifice that some of us have to make. Uh, as far as for the opportunity, you know, the, the the entrepreneur part in all three of us and the siblings. Yeah, I mean, look, my here's the thing, right? My dad uh, was, or I should say is, uh, he's still alive, but he's a very smart guy. Um, when he lived in Israel, he owned his own computer company. Uh, and he was a genius in my eyes as a child growing up. And then once we moved to the U.S., due to the lack of um, language barriers, because he had a very thick accent when we first moved, um, he ended up having to take just a normal job, a construction job. And that's the job he ended up holding for the rest of the time until he retired. 
which I think to me, it, it really is probably part of the, if we're going to get all therapeutical here for a minute, like <laughs> therapy session, I mean, um, is probably why, one of the reasons why I kind of refuse to learn Swedish is because there's part of me that's worried that, that if I speak Swedish, I will sound a little less because I remember very much so going around with my dad to places and and some people looking at him especially in California people looking at him like you're in America speak English you know and it was just kind of like looking at them and going my dad's super smart just because he can't speak as clearly as you can right now that doesn't mean he's not as smart as you if not smarter and it was one of those things that really frustrated me that that some people would choose to look at you differently just because you were foreign and if anything if you know two languages that automatically makes you smarter than that person but people don't understand that and i think that here i kind of have this hesitancy to to learn the language because i want to be the smartest person at the meeting if i'm sitting across with all these ceos and stuff from whatever company i want to be the one that feels comfortable if i speak their language i become uncomfortable so it's kind of like being in control of the room and i'd rather them be uncomfortable than myself <laughs> i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but it's been working yeah um so well, and it's, yeah. it's, it's incredibly insightful to to have that and obviously for somewhat from from painful experiences and it's also like hearing the story re really frustrating because you try to quantify or think how much we've missed out from incredibly tar smart and talented people that have maybe not been placed in a bucket where they've been able to exploit that because of that. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's probably a different situation. And maybe Jim has the same kind of history in his family, but m my family came from, from Italy and my grandpa and his siblings spent an incredible amount of time working on getting rid of, of any kind of accent and they mm. weren't allowed to speak Italian in the home and they changed their names because they didn't want to be seen as, you know, they wanted to be seen as Americans so they could be smart yeah. and be included. Yeah. And it's like, how much, how much did we lose by them having to spend all this time trying to be something that they, they weren't, you know, it's frustrating yeah. that, that as, as well, and imagine having to like feed, they, they probably sensed, everything that me, my father was going through and everything that I've noticed my father go through. And they realized like, we have to change direction if we want to be able to succeed in this country. And it's funny to me that, and I'm not trying to get too political here because that's not what this podcast is for, but it's, it's one of those things where I always felt like if there was ever a time to recognize the value of, of immigration, um, especially in a, in a day where everybody goes on Twitter on their iPhones and complains about immigration, not realizing that, you know, Steve Jobs' dad was Syrian. Um, <laughs> you know, had yeah. he not immigrated to America, you wouldn't even be holding an iPhone, but neither here nor there. Um, you know what I mean? But it's it's one of those things where, like, I I kind of feel like my dad made the sacrifice he felt was best for us. And I shouldn't just say my dad, it was a it was a mutual between him and my mother, but in the same sense that we made that sacrifice. And um, look, at the end of the day, that racism part or that that part of the world still exists. I unfortunately have suffered it here. I've, I've had it happen even recently. Uh, I had somebody call my phone from an unknown block number, and they just kept saying, oh, you're not Swedish. You have to leave the country. You're not allowed to stay. And I'm like... Who the, who the F is this? And they're like, you heard us. You're not allowed. And they literally said, you are Shai Dahan. And then they said my address. So they clearly were trying to oh, take man. control by saying, yeah. we know where you we live. Know. Yeah. Um, and I went ahead and made a police report about it. But it's just one of those things like, I'm in my 40s. Like, why do I need to worry about somebody like calling me, telling me to get the fuck out of, my, out of this country? Right. But um, so it goes to show that it happens anywhere. It, it, there isn't a safe zone anywhere on this planet. It happens anywhere you go. But so let's let's stay political here. Um, you've painted murals all over the place, but yeah. I would love for you to talk about your experience painting on the wall and how that came to be and what what you learned and kind of what impact because i think you know you've mentioned the impact was much more than just you being there painting it's yeah it's carried forward in a, in a major way in a major way yeah on on multiple levels so so first of all i should start off by saying that um i was born in israel so i'm an israeli citizen with an israeli passport 
And uh, there is a law that states that unless you live in Palestine as a Jew, you are technically not supposed to be traveling in and out of Palestine. At least if that rule is still current, I do not know, but at least back in 2012, that's, that's from my understanding was the case. And at the time I had a friend who was in Ramallah as uh, a journalist. And at the time I kind of been dealing a lot personally with this whole, you know, in, in, I, as I mentioned, I come from this background where, where my family's from Morocco, but we grew up in Israel and, and we were raised in a home where you should love. My parents used to listen to the Beatles all the time, raising us like peace and love and take care of each other kind of vibe. Um, and I, I always joke and say, my parents must have been hippies and smoking the doobies when we were born because my name is Shai and my brother's name is Guy. And the only logical <laughs> explanation is that they got high one night and said, what should we name the small one? And I'm like, let's make them rhyme. So <laughs> what should we name the small one? Shai and Guy. That's genius. Now that's easy. It's Shai and Guy. You know, uh, you, 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 young- you, you've been to their new place. They're still hippies. What do you mean we're oh, hippies? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's how I feel like whenever they used to find my weed when I was in high school and used to be like, we threw it out. Oh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> After the kids went to bed, like, honey, look what I got to find. Was it Shai or Kai? I don't know which one is which anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, where were we? Palestine. Yeah. So, um, I decided that I wanted to travel into Palestine specifically to paint on the wall on the Palestinian side, because to me, I kind of felt like I want to prove that a person with an Israeli background can travel into this country. And I should take a step back and say that I've always been a firm believer that art, and I've did a, I've done a whole TEDx talk about it. And anybody that's into TEDx talks, go to YouTube, type in Shai Dahan, and you'll find it. It'll be, it'll um, be included in the show notes. There you go. Uh, ding! Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it, it's, it's, I've always said that art is like a language that everybody speaks, right? It's the one language that we all understand. Like, even if I don't speak the same language as you, if I paint something on the wall, we're communicating with each other. And I kind of said, I want to be able to travel into this place and show that if I strip away religion and where I'm from and where I was born, and if these people don't know that, they just see me as a guy who comes to add something to their art, to, to this ugly gray wall that they're literally imprisoned in and add some art to it. Um, then I want to prove that I can walk out safe, like nothing will happen to me. And of course, there's never a guarantee, but but I wanted to show that it is possible, right? Um, and I was taking a big risk. I mean, look, uh, you, there were only three people on this planet that knew I was going, which was my father my wife, which took a lot of convincing, um, and my cousin in Israel, who was the person like in the event that something happened, this, my dad was like, if something happened, you call your cousin Roby, this is his number. And I said, dad, if something happens, I don't think they allow you a phone call. Like it's not present in America. Like, okay, listen, we're going to like take you, but you get one phone call. If you want to call someone, you know, like it's not going to happen that way. But it, it it was something that I always felt like I I had to achieve. I had to do it, and, and there was no nobody was fun, funding it, nobody was sponsoring it. It was just a personal project, um, and I ended up traveling in there. And while I can't go into details how I was able to get in, I did manage to get into Palestine. And over the course of three days, I painted this five meter. Sorry, Swedish. Uh, I don't know what five meters is <laughs> feet these days, um, but uh, the five meter wall uh, on the Palestinian side. And it's funny because I remember when I did it, I got a lot of uh, messages on social media from people who said, why didn't you do it on the Tel Aviv? Like, why didn't you do it on the Israeli side? Or why didn't you come to Tel Aviv and paint? And I said, because that would have been the easy part. Like I'm an Israeli, of course I can go paint there. The whole idea was that I wanted to do something that not was, wasn't just a challenge, but it was something that has a message that I'm proving a point. Like it, it's not just the art on the wall, but it's the journey. It's the whole story of being able to get into Palestine. And I'll tell you, man, painting in Palestine, I thought would be one of the scariest things on the planet. 
Um, and it ended up being one of the most awakening moments of my career because here I was standing on a ladder. First of all, I'm coming into a country that doesn't have your local Home Depot. So getting paint or anything to use on a wall, you have to go through these like alleyways and find like somebody who was selling paint on the side of the road. It wasn't like here's a paint shop. And the paint you're getting is like in a bucket that looks reused. I remember it specifically what it looked like. And I was like, are you sure this is paint and not just like old milk? You know, <laughs> it was just really weird. Um, but it was this beautiful thing. And, and the whole time I was painting, uh, there was a group of kids that would stand there and watch me paint. And they were like so excited. And every time I would turn around, they'd be like, you know, and we didn't speak the language and they didn't speak any English, but they, they knew how to communicate the excitement and inspiration that they were getting from it. Um, and then there was a guy who owned a small coffee shop right behind where I was painting. And every day he would say, come, come have coffee. And I remember the very first day I was very nervous because I was like, Fuck, this is my first time here. Like, how, how is this going to go? Um, and he was like, come, come. And I said, no, no, thank you. And my friend who's been in Ramallah for a long time said, no, no, when you when they offer you coffee, you have to go and have coffee. So sure enough, we take a break, we go sit down. And I'm literally sitting down, the same way I'm sitting across from you, is just sitting down and having coffee with this man. And he's talking to us and my buddy's over here to my left. And at one point, my friend leans over and he tells me, do you realize that you're probably one of the very first people in your family to just be able to like peacefully sit across from a Palestinian because you guys are not talking religion. You're not, he doesn't know where you're from. He doesn't know your heritage. He doesn't know that you're from across the other side of this wall. And he's giving you coffee and you're laughing and joking and talking about your painting. And he's asking you questions about how do you paint so big? How do you, you know, like the same questions they ask you in Sweden and here, here you are. And I think it was a very beautiful moment because it made me realize what it was like for my grandfather who came from Morocco and being able to kind of just be surrounded by different cultures and different people who spoke different languages. And there wasn't this like, you know, anger and, and, and political side to things. Even though what I was doing was very political, it, it was a very peaceful political statement, I should say. Um, and when it was all said and done, I, came out and uh, not too long after did my TEDx talk and had an incredible response to it, you know, and, it, and it's ever since then, my career has shifted to try to do projects that benefit um, the community or society in some way. And, and I still hold that. I try every year to do something. I know for a fact that I do something every year since Palestine, but I even try to take it on a much larger scale. Um, because to me, I think that those are the projects that end up really making an impact and a difference uh, on people. I can paint a horse on a wall any day, but doing a project like that is something that's going to have, even though the artwork there is probably gone by now, the story itself is what matters. And these are the stories that get passed on and passed on and passed on, you know? Um, and that's that's what I really want is to be able to inspire people with this with the story. So, yeah, man, incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, I to be fun. I swear to God, if my wife was down here, she'd tell you. I was this close uh, a week into the Ukrainian war. I looked at my wife and she's like, no. <laughs> and I told her, I was literally looking at ways of how can I get into Ukraine to paint? And she said, not again. She's like, when you went into Palestine, you had no kids. Now you have three kids to think about, like prioritize that. And I said, and she's like, no. <laughs> but, but even, but even still like the, the um, Ukrainian artwork that you've put out is incredibly powerful. And Thank you, you you just look at it and it just, it hits, you know? So maybe it doesn't have the same kind of weight as, as going into a country under attack, but you know, you still finding ways to, to, to make an impact. Yeah. And I mean, look at the end of the day, that's, that leads to the point of, of that it, it speaks, you know, like there wasn't anything I could write 17 paragraphs long on an Instagram post yeah. that would have the same, equation as as just that one image um, and that image went incredibly viral and 
I was still able to help with it because I realized how viral it went. So I decided to put the original up for auction and it ended up raising a ton of money. And then I ended up making prints of that image and selling them and having a hundred percent go toward, you know, awesome. uh, all these different charities that were helping Ukraine. Um, so it had this like butterfly effect where like, sometimes you feel something, you put it on paper and it catches fire and you just kind of say, okay, I can either just let it catch fire and stand and take the fame and, and, you know, all the interviews, or you can say, you know, here's an opportunity to actually help with this cause that I actually was trying to, to portray in the first place. And I think that that's, that's what differentiates is you have to look at it and say, am I doing this for myself or am I doing it for others? And I think prior to Palestine, a lot of my career was about myself. After Palestine, it's all about my work should be about everybody else, yeah. you know, which is why I do Project Playground charity every single year. It's why I travel to South Africa to, to, to help the, the charity there. It's it's why I continuously do charity work and, and try to do all these programs. It's why I put together and founded a street art festival in Sweden that ended up inspiring a whole generation of kids. I was recently, um, the, the short version is, is that in 2013, I I was the founder and, and director of a, of one of the very first street art festivals in Sweden because they had a very strict zero tolerance law in Sweden for public art, specifically street art. And as a street artist, I said, F all that, we're going to put on a festival. And, <laughs> you know, we, we put on this festival um, with a lot of hesitation from people. And there's a lot of great stories in, <laughs> in that whole thing. Um, but that was like 2013, 2014. And recently I had somebody tell me uh, in Bros, they said, uh, you know, I was in high school when the first festival happened and I never thought about doing art because, you know, everybody pushes you toward doing this or that, but not street art. And he's like, the festival was happening and I went out and I stood for hours watching these artists take a wall and turn it into a freaking canvas. And it was incredible and it inspired me. So I began to practice doing murals in my garage and began to paint. And this kid now is in his 20s. Like he was in high school in 2014. He's in his 20s now and he's talking to me and he says, I just want you to know that recently I got my very first commission job. Someone is paying me to come and paint a mural inside this restaurant. And that would have never happened had you never started this festival. And it made me kind of choke up because it made me realize there's a whole new generation of street artists now that are starting off from something that I was able to put down. And it comes down to this motto that I've followed from the very beginning, which is a very, very old, um, I think it's a Greek proverb that basically says, in a nutshell, it's, uh, I'm not exact to it, but uh, that our society is at its best when we plant trees that we know we don't get to sit under, right? Like the idea is, is you should do something even if you know you don't get to enjoy what comes out of it. And the festival is very much that, is that I did this festival. I got to enjoy the beginning and the process of bringing the artist and watching them paint. But those murals are now there. And they've been there. They're going to celebrate their 10-year anniversary next year. They're still there. And they continue to inspire generation after generation after generation. There's kids that were born in 2015 in that city that only know that city as a city of art. Like they don't know what was there before. And that's beautiful to me that, that I just came up and was able to spread this art all of, all around town. So I have yeah. to, uh, I have to pull up a, a saved clip because it's, it's, it's such a incredibly, incredibly powerful message. Um, and I think we get so caught up in the here and now and what's in it for, for us that we, we lose sight that we're, I think all of us in such an incredible position to impact generations and generations, right? I, and I think about it as this, uh, as this ripple effect where you really, and you know, I'm sure you have no idea you you're getting bits and pieces. You talk to this one kid, but that's just one part of one ripple, right. one, one thing out, who knows how far, how far it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's incredible. I can't find the clip. I, I had it saved somewhere. Oh, here it is. It's so amazing, it doesn't matter if it's yours or not. There's that lovely thing. A society grows great when old men plant trees, the shade of which they know they will never sit in. Right. Woo. 
that gave me the and show. to be fair <laughs> i didn't say old men because i'm you know men women yeah <laughs> whatever anyway. you know, I'm, I'm for everyone all, all, all right let's shift so we're, we we give a little balance to the heaviness um yeah can are you able to talk a little bit about when were, were you on some island painting a mural and some like was it a jockey or a professional soccer player was just hanging out and does this ring a bell <laughs> a little bit yes um mallorca which i'm actually leaving to on tuesday once again um to back to mallorca um and it was uh it was a very inspiring trip so it, it one of the things that that happens um and i don't know how it happens but but i keep finding myself in these situations where i feel like i'm in some bizarre uh TV show, like a scripted show, because these situations are happening. Which, I'm like, which you How? were in, right? <laughs> no, um, no, but didn't no. didn't didn't you do some reality television, something or something, or you did you did artwork for some reality show or some television show in Sweden? I did, I did, uh, no, I did do artwork for a, a reality show here in Sweden called okay. Somike Betre, which yeah, is, yeah. literally stands for so much better. Which, by the way, is an incredible show. I'm surprised they don't have it in the U.S. Sorry, I didn't um, want to get you sidetracked, yeah. but I remember no, that. Oh, so. that's okay. It's a tangent, whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Right. Um, but uh, this career has led me into these particular situations that are sometimes almost hysterical. Uh, for example, you're talking about Mallorca and coming to Mallorca and being able to find myself um, painting a, a, a this very lovely couple who I, I consider friends now. And, and they own this beautiful vineyard. Uh, they bought this old uh, building, historical building and converted it to their house slash vineyard slash um, horse, I should say facility where, where they raise horses and train horses. And um, they invited me to paint inside their house, inside the space. And I, I painted this big mural in there. Uh, and one day they're having an event and they kind of tell me, oh, come on, uh, uh, hang out during the event. And I'm kind of standing there and chit chatting with some people and some guy comes over and, and he chats with me along with another younger guy. Um, and he asks me, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm a street artist, whatever. And then he, he, he goes away and the guy next to me kind of taps me and he's like, that was pretty cool for you. Right. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> he's like, Oh, you don't know who that is. Those two people are. And I'm like, well, I'm assuming the old man is just some rich old guy and the younger guy. I don't know. Is it like his lover? I don't know. Cause I'm completely <laughs> oblivious. Right. Which by the way happens all the time. I'll give you another story in a minute, which is like even more hilarious. Um, but it, it's one of those things where like, I have no clue who it is. And he's like, the old guy, he's apparently like one of the richest men in the UK. His boat is so big that they don't allow it to come into Port of Mallorca. He has to park it out and then take a smaller boat into the island. And I said, so the younger guy is his lover? And he's like, no, the younger guy is the guy who won the Tour de France last year. And I said, excuse me? He's like, you know, the, 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 and I'm like, I know what the Tour de France is. Um, and that guy won it. He's like the world champion in Tour de France. And I'm like, I wish somebody would have told me this at the beginning. I'd have been like, so here's my business card. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but it's 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 a very uh, strange space to be an art. I think it's funny because I think like people look at artists as like still even now, a lot of people look at artists as thinking like you're either doing it as a hobby or you're you're broke like they people can't wrap their minds around that this is a career i can't tell you how often i've had people ask like people who used to work with my wife or something who would say uh so what does your husband do for work and she'd say he's an artist and they're like yeah yeah but what does he actually do for work work and she's like he's an artist and they would say yeah but what does he do for money and she's like he makes more than all of us that's what he does for work <laughs> you know and they couldn't wrap their head about like how is a guy painting walls making earning a living and they don't realize that there is a career path in it and that I'm actually doing quite well. Uh, and I'm not saying that works out for everyone that way, but it, it all depends on how hard you grind away. And, and it took years to get to where I'm at, but um, it's one of those moments where now in my career, I can reflect back and say all of it was worth it because I'm in a place where, you know, I can 
casually meet the guy who won the Tour de France and have no clue who he is until he <laughs> left the building. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those uh, very strange moments. I, it's it's also very fortunate because it allows me to be able to give back more, if that makes sense. My, my whole goal of my career has never been to like, I want to be on magazine covers and I want to be filthy rich. Like that never was my drive. My drive was to make change and impact on people and society and things like that, specifically after uh, Palestine. Um, and what I realized is that there's two ways I could take my career, right? There's the, the, the path of like, okay, I'm meeting important people, I'm meeting successful people, I'm going to take advantage of that so I can become rich and successful and famous. Or you can say I'm meeting interesting people, people in, in interesting positions that are buying my art and hiring me. And because people know my name, I can help other places, right? By, for example, putting uh, my Ukraine art up for sale and hope fully raise as much money as possible for it. Um, you know, I do this charity every year called Project Playground, which is a charity that was started by uh, two, two women, one of them being the princess of Sweden. Um, and every year I attend their charity dinner and I donate a painting and my paintings go in, up for auction at these dinner places and 100% goes toward the charity. And every year I end up giving more and more to them because what we found is, is that with every year that goes by, whenever I, I donate something, it goes so quickly that we kind of go, man, we should have had two things or three things, you know? So then we start adding every year, we start adding more and more things because at the end of the day, I want to use the fact that people are aware of who I am. They know my name, at least in Sweden. I want to use that toward giving back to society rather than just, you know, sitting on a chair and saying oh you know people know who i am yay like who gives a shit you know like i don't yeah, know yeah. you know at the end of the day i kind of it's it's like to me it's like anybody whether it's the prince and princess of sweden or whether it's somebody here in kalmar it to me they're on the same level for me in the sense that if somebody chooses to spend their hard-earned money on my work um that is so meaningful to me, especially in this day and age where we have social media, as people can go on and buy art from anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. Someone is choosing to spend, whether it's 50 bucks, 500 bucks or $5,000 on my work. To me, that's so meaningful that like they can, especially when it's art, because everybody has such limited space, except you, you tend to just go buck wild with your art, Jason, apparently, according to your background. <laughs> but um, that, that's a Dahan. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those things where like, if somebody has such limited space on their yeah. walls for art and they're choosing to add me in there and that's, that's really meaningful. So, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I, I feel fortunate that I have lots of wall space and I feel incredibly honored that lots of that art, art space is filled with your art. And I'm looking uh, at thank you. your, one of my most favorite paintings that, that you did, um, right above my, my computer, which came from Sweden, which is amazing. Um, and your artwork is all throughout my house and it's amazing. And um, yeah, just, just honored and really honored that you would take an hour with us to, to chat. Oh, I, I mean, I can go on talking for, for hours, oh, um, <laughs> um, but you know, your story is so incredibly uh, inspirational and, and I'm, and, and I know people listening today are going to find a lot of inspiration. I think it's the beautiful thing about what we do is that we don't have to talk about ones and zeros and data all the time. There's so yeah. much that the people we talk to can walk away with inspiration to, to do whatever they're doing. And this is one of those conversations conversations that's just super super powerful and, and i feel like that goes for anyone who's a creative not just necessarily an artist i'll give a quick thing my wife wanted to do fashion so she was 16 i met her in la while she was studying fashion we moved to new york so she can go to fit which is one of the biggest fashion schools in the u.s she did five years there came out of there did 10 years as a high level employee in the fashion industry um, for 10 years, grinded it out. Pandemic hit and just like me during 2008, got laid off. And because of that layoff and nobody in the fashion industry was hiring, uh, she's always in the same way that I was grinding away at Wells Fargo, but always truly wanted to paint. 
she was working in the fashion industry, but always truly was a creative in writing. Um, and I was able to return the favor that she did for me by saying, you know what, until you get find a job, take, take some time and focus on your writing. And she put all of her time and energy into writing. And in December of this year, she got her very first publisher. And today, actually today, she signed a contract with the second publisher for her, for a second book. So now she has two publishers with two books being released this year. And she's never looking back toward the fashion industry. She found her path now to start her own next 10 years of career doing writing, Amazing. which is her passion. So sometimes you can have a career in something for 10 years before you realize or given the opportunity whether you're being laid off or whatever it is to go explore your true passion and if you put that energy into that instead of into a cubicle then you yeah. suddenly realize when you put that energy into yourself it, it flourishes amazing well shy thank you jim i'll let you wrap us up and kick us out because shy and i can yeah keep going do, do you have any questions jim you've been there so pilot. we I've, I've renamed them jim the jew uh... <laughs> yeah it, it's just some, some conversation before in the green room while we yeah. were before before we started but no like I, honestly i i probably could but that last little bit i i don't want to 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 take away from what, what you said i want to leave it at that like yeah you know very inspirational and yeah i think people are going to love this episode because it is a departure from some of our normal topics which i think is great um and i think we need that refresher and and perspective especially you know your, your multiple examples of taking risks and and how, how they um and how they've turned out for you. So yeah, I'll just echo Jason's statement. It, it's been awesome chatting with you. And you know, the, a lot of times like with episodes like these, I just take the role of the producer. I sit back and let others talk. Cause sometimes I feel like on these shows, if I'm doing talk, if I'm talking, it, it's yeah, yeah, I'm not doing my job. And I, I, I'm a talker, so uh, <laughs> which is which is because I don't get to talk to adults a lot. I'm usually talking to my kids, so and they're like Lugan Strugan Bugan Dugan to me. So I don't know what the hell's going on. I just look at them and go, like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, thanks so much for taking the time my and and joining us. And yeah, this was a fun episode. If I can recommend anything to any of your listeners, come to Sweden. There is something about Sweden that is just magical. Don't believe anything you've seen in that Midsummer movie. We don't throw people off quests. Just trust me, you would love uh, Sweden. Uh, come visit us, especially in spring and summertime. Uh, you won't regret it, I promise. And enjoy the coffee and the views yeah, and, and the acquaintance. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Cool. Awesome. Thank you both. Peace, we'll love. Everybody. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Cheers. See you. Bye. Bye.